Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We've just given a, a couple of extra minutes so everyone can filter in. And I can see people are still walking in the door after a very nice lunch. I hope everyone had a very enjoyable lunch and got a cup of tea or a coffee. Uh, my name is uh, Zach Munn. I'm the chair of GIN, and it's my absolute honour to be chairing this uh, fourth plenary session along with Roberta. Uh, we've got some excellent speakers uh, for you all this afternoon, and each of the speakers will go for about 28 minutes or thereabouts, uh, and there'll be time for one clarif clarifying question, uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion at the end as well. And the theme of the plenary session is Guidelines Without Borders, Developing Recommendations to Guide Care Globally. And I'm, I know I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this session. Uh, we have some fantastic speakers. We have uh, Marge Reinup, uh, Carla Soares Weiser, and Laurie Morrison. But I'd like to introduce my co-chair for this session, uh, Roberta. Roberta? Afternoon, everybody. Uh, my my name is Roberta James, and I'm the program lead at Sign, and I'm one of the trustees uh, on the board this year. Um, so it's my great pleasure to uh, invite Laurie Morrison to be our first speaker in this session. Um, Dr. Morrison is a professor and clini clini clinician scientist at the Division of Emergency Medicine, Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Her program of research is focused on the evaluation and implementation of time-sensitive interventions in acute emergencies and she conducts clinical trials, systematic reviews and meta-analysis in topics pertaining to resuscitation and emergency medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you to the Program Committee for this kind invitation and opportunity to speak on behalf of the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. I have no conflicts of interest with industry, but I hold peer-reviewed research grants from the Canadian, the US government, and from charitable foundations. The International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation was born in 1992 based on some uh, scientists across the world meeting at a meeting just like this. It was born, uh, it was derived by the scientists as a forum for a liaison between the principal resuscitation organizations, which are now called councils worldwide. The vision is to save more lives globally through resuscitation, and uh, the mission is to promote disseminate and advocate for international implementation of evidence-informed resuscitation and first aid using a transparent evaluation and consensus summary of scientific data. Currently, there are eight councils contributing to ILCOR representing Canada, the United States, Asia is lumped as one giant council, South America, South Africa, the European Resuscitation Council, and New Zealand and Australia are together as, as um, the Australian-New Zealand Single Resuscitation Council. We publish consensus on science and treatment recommendations at the same time that the councils publish their council guidelines. So we distribute the consensus on science and treatment recommendations to the councils they generate their council guidelines, which are specific to their country or region, and they're all published simultaneously. The domain of resuscitation is huge. So in order to cover the content, we developed six task forces, and they're populated by 17 international members. We work virtually for the most part, and the domains are divided into advanced life support, basic life support, education implementation teams, first aid, pediatrics, and neonatal. And that covers the gamut of the content of resuscitation. Each task force takes their domain or their content area and generates a number of PICO questions. In total, we have over 400 questions that define the content area of resuscitation science. 
and they all are worded in exactly the same formatted way. Then each task force ranks the PICO based on publication alerts, contro controversies in the, in the published literature, expert opinion, um, or um, in patient engagement where the patients have generated an interest. And so the task force takes all that input and then decides what are the top ranked PICOs for this year assigns a lead and we always have a mentee involved because we're trying to build capacity in countries that are not strong in systematic and scoping reviews. We employ GRADE and we collaborate with information specialists and experts and knowledge synthesis units in systematic reviews and scoping reviews. We use GRADE to to generate our risk of bias tables and to input all that data into the evidence tables just as all of you would when you employ GRADE. And we generate, it's a formatted consensus on science, this is the format. So for every PICO question a consensus on science is generated which has exactly the same sort of wording. And you can see here for the critical outcome of survival we identified very low quality evidence from two RCTs. The level of evidence was downgraded for risk of bias, indirectness, and imprecision. So the format is the same. We then post them on the ILCOR website for public commentary, and we get responses from laypersons, industry, other clinicians, practicing clinicians, across the spectrum of allied health professionals who contribute to resuscitation and of course colleagues and scientists. We use what we, what we receive by public commentary, we use that to refine the consensus on science interpretation to generate a treatment recommendation. And then as I mentioned previously, we co-publish with the councils their council guidelines. So um, a reviewer or an, an, um, a reader could see the cons consensus on science and treatment recommendation and how that was derived in the one document by ILCOR and in the council guide guidelines see how it will be applied at the bedside in that nation. There's very good concordance between the consensus on science and what is published in the council guidelines. We weren't too sure, so we did this paper in 2020. We published this paper to show good alignment between what the scientists said by looking at the evidence and what the council guidelines wrote. But we do have our Achilles heel, and it's really a triumvirate of an evidence problem a knowledge transfer problem and a measurement problem. So our processes of trying to get the science to the bedside has um, multiple issues, but these are our triumvirate. First is evidence. The quality of evidence in resuscitation is not as strong as we'd like it, mostly because we have to use waiver of consent. So we waive consent to randomize patients in all our trials, and those are very complicated trials to do. They're very challenging to perform. So the quality of evidence it is often not there. We have to use patient values and preferences, and we have to balance between benefits and harms and poor quality evidence. Many of our recommendations are weak or conditional, and we often use the words we suggest. The quality of evidence is also very geographically biased. It's most of our evidence comes from high income countries. So it's hard to put in place guidelines that are useful across the world. Recently we conducted a scoping review looking at clinical outcomes from low resource settings. In other words, we were trying to see, since most of our data is fairly biased, what is the data that comes out of low resource settings? And we were doing a scoping review because we were trying to use gray literature. Unfortunately, we could only find middle, in, middle income country data. But you can see from here that we covered Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and South America. But there were a lot of biases. First of all, we had to extrapolate from middle income 
to low income. And second, you can see on the right-hand side, I guess if I do that down there, you don't see it. So I have to do it over here, and only this group sees it. So I'm going to say it aloud. <laughs> the study population is very large on the left-hand side of that graph. The event, which is return of circulation, which for resuscitation is an early marker of survival, the event rate is high on the right. So you can see as the population gets, as the amount, number of people involved in the study gets less and less and less, the outcome, the favorable outcome, gets more and more and more uh, often seen. So that is the smaller the cohort, the better the, uh, the outcome. That certainly is a reporting bias. Small populations, if you only sample a small population, you most likely see the event rate is high. So in these cases, we use evidence to decision tables. We use our values and preferences, and we use a lot of expert opinion to, um, to contribute to a recommendation. And this is our classic um, way of looking at the data at the decision table level. For example, in making these recommendations, we placed a higher value on the potential effect of X and a lower value on the harms of X. We recognize the evidence in support of these recommendations comes from RCTs and observational data of variable quality. However, the available evidence consistently favors X suggesting a dose effect. Recently, GRADE has published um, how to use GRADE when there is no evidence. So in some of our PICO questions, uh, we only have case reports or case series. Um, that's often seen in toxicology as well as resuscitation. And what GRADE is recommending is that if you look at the cases that are in the published literature, which is in that middle column, and then you compare it to all your experts around the table, ask them how many times they've seen a child or an adult with that, and you add up the number of cases they have treated as experts, that's the column on the right. And so, in, in other words, they're suggesting that we, this is a, a, a paper dedicated to a methodology that we could use case series and case reports. Why is this important? Well, in neonatal and first aid task forces, we have a lot of low resource and middle re, um, um, mid resource countries that have issues with the implementation of our guidelines. And we ask, we now are asking questions that specifically for how to answer this question, how to implement in low resource and mid resource um, countries. And we're using a much broader uh, population of experts. So we broaden beyond the 17 people in the task force. Neonatal, for example, has 50 people outside the task force all over the world who meet virtually to contribute to uh, answer questions like this. So this is a neonatal question that is looking at does therapeutic hypothermia, which is cooling the body, does cooling the body to a target temperature for a defined duration, when it's compared to just standard care, which is not cooling, does that improve outcomes in preterm and term babies with moderate or severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy managed in low resource settings? Most of this data will be case reports, and by using that broad population of experts across the world, they should be able to apply that new grade methodology. Our second contributor to our Achilles heel, to the, what affects our ability to translate from science to guideline to bedside, is our ability to transfer the data. In resuscitation, it, um, outcomes are affected by the chain of survival. So it, each, each link in this chain of survival must be performed beautifully in the community if the patient's going to survive. And so the formula for survival in resuscitation is not only good science and educational efficiency, but also local implementation. However, even in first world EMS systems, we have problems. 
All are outcomes that are important to us, which are survival, functional survival, bystander care. Did the bystander do compressions on the chest? Did the bystander run and grab the defibrillator and put it on the chest and rescue the patient? Um, did the EMS provider do good quality chest compressions? Did the patient have access to every ICU intervention? And did the ICU intensivist withdraw therapy prematurely? So those outcomes all show in Canadian and US data that there are disparities across men and women, race, income, neighborhoods, regions, and between countries. So we aren't doing a very good job at implementing or knowledge transfer in first world. Most of our guidelines are derived on with an urban data bias, which was shown very beautifully in this lovely paper by Aaron Orkin. Right now, Americans and Canadians and Europeans, our guidelines say that if you see someone with a cardiac arrest, you should push hard and push fast. So the focus is all on chest compressions and encouraging you to have the courage to do what, what is right, which is just compress the chest. But we also, in the old days, used to teach rescue breathing. And in fact, what we've done using urban data is recently just emphasize push hard and push fast. And we've sort of suspended animation for rescue breathing. And by using urban data, the reason we do that is because we know all of you know that today, sitting right here, if we started chest compressions on one of us, there'd be a paramedic come through that door in 7.54 minutes. So, that doesn't happen in low resource areas. It doesn't happen in rural settings in Canada. So, push hard, push fast may be great if you live in Toronto, but it may not be the right implementation of the science when you live in a rural area with long response long transit times, paramedic wouldn't be seen for hours. And we also, in these rural settings, we really need the dispatcher to assist the layperson on the telephone to do the right thing. And that all gets lost when you're using urban data that just says push hard, push fast. We've been doing task shifting without knowing it had this really nice label without knowing anything about it actually, because the first three links in this chain of survival for resuscitation are all dependent on the bystander. Did they call 911, did they start chest compressions, and did they grab that little defibrillator and put it on their chest? Those are the first three links in the chain of survival. So we've been task sh shifting without knowing. There was a lovely uh, systematic review looking at, in emergency medicine, could we make a difference in low and middle income countries from conditions that could be treated with emergency care if we shifted the care into a layperson's hands? So there was a lovely SR published which asked the questions, what interventions can be delivered effectively by lay people to save lives and reduce morbidity? We found it could, be, it could be done in all of these circumstances, from snake bites to cardiac arrest. The WHO in published in 2005 that this was true in trauma as well. You could easily help a trauma patient reduce morbidity and mortality by putting it in the hands of lay people. A good example of that is in, in, in Canada is our indigenous communities because our indigenous people are overrepresented among populations with the poorest health in Canada. They have very poor healthcare infrastructure and we need to build their capacity to save each other, which is very true for low resource as well. So I just want to or orient you that you're sitting in Toronto on Lake Ontario, which is down at the bottom of this pink map, and Hudson Bay, which is a frozen Iceland, is above at the top. And this tiny little First Nation community is just south of Hudson Bay, and a group of investigative resuscitation scientists went there and said, okay, when there isn't a paramedic, and we want you to save yourselves, how do you want to be taught? What's the best way to give you this information so that you will translate it into action at the moment that counts? And it was wonderful because um, 
all the indigenous community um, participated in this and was really engaged. And they said, we need excellence in education, just like everybody else, but we need to use locally appropriate materials and methods. And we need an emphasis on our local geography and our health needs, not what's, what was um, is apparent in urban centers. And so they ended up with an educational intervention which was community-based, first responder, geographically and culturally relevant, that slowly over time built their local capacity to save each other. And finally, our last Achilles heel is our ability to measure. In resuscitation, we have cardiac arrest registries all over the world, but you can see they're all in high-income countries. So we generate data on how effective we are with essentially urban guidelines. We have big data problems. The clinical reality of resuscitation is that it's frequent in communities, but very few people survive. So the event rate that we're looking for, the favorable one, survival, doesn't occur very often. So we need to share data across borders. We need individual clinical data. We cannot use administrative data. And we have multiple sources feeding into the journey or the trajectory of the resuscitation patient, including paramedics and out of hospital, in hospital, rehabilitation, and then discharge into the community. What is the, the largest impediments for us are privacy legislation and ethics concerns for sharing across data sets and for a legal framework and agreements that is ins insular, protecting the institute rather than enabling the science. And finally, what impedes us is in the lack of integratable data platforms across all these sources. On closure, when I first started preparing for this talk, I used your library on the GIN website to find out, I put in the word resuscitation, I got six hits, CPR during commercial flights and CPR during space, like you guys are way out there. <laughs> we haven't even covered that. <laughs> and we have 400 research questions on resuscitation. The top two was really redeeming for me because it's only in Finnish and my Finnish is really suspect. Um, but the first two are all in Finnish and what they are, which was so redeeming, was it's a Finnish translation of the European Resuscitation Council, which of course was derived by the ILCOR consensus on science. So we are working together without even knowing we are. Thank you. Hi, thanks, thanks so much for that, Laurie. Really, really interesting uh, talk. Very uh, interesting to see the, the disparities between urban and, and rural. Um, so thank you very much for that. So what I'll do is I'll open up to one question just for clarity, and then we can have the discussion at the end as before. Perhaps that whole talk was so confusing you can't even choose the priority for clarification. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm going to take the prerogative here, and I, I just wondered if you could elaborate slightly on the, um, the evidence to recommendation framework that you were using with the, the case studies and, and using the expert opinion, how, how you went about that and, and whether it was easy or difficult. Or... So we exclude case series. We exclude case series and case reports. Um, uh, and we only will accept uh, currently that we don't. But this new paper that has come out from GRADE, Eddie Lang is, sits on, advises us on the GRADE in ILCOR, and he identified this paper. And uh, now we're venturing forth to see, we have been so um, selective in the past in saying no case reports, no case series, no nothing. Um, but now we're going to try because we end up with no science if we ask a question which is low resource or middle income or any of these uh, clarifiers that would make the filter so tight, we end up with no science. Um, so we'll look for some case series and case reports. But if we still don't have any, what I really liked in this paper was it said, okay, if you don't have any paper, look around, if you don't have any published papers, look around at who's sitting at the table or who's on Zoom. 
and ask them how many times they've seen this a patient with this disease and then add up all the cases across every expert that's providing. You might have more cases in the experts on Zoom than, well, you certainly would have more than most of the things we see because there are no published cases for what we're looking for. But that's what Grade was saying is that you might get hundreds if you look at published literature for case reports, but if you ask the people on who are helping you or looking at the science and add up all the cases they've seen of those patients, um, then you might have a much larger case series just based on their expert opinion and what they have themselves treated. Yeah. So it's a new venue for us. Do you have another question? Uh, just um, excellent presentation. I wanted to ask uh, about your comment on involving a mentee in some of the task force. Mm. You said that you preferably take it from low and middle income country. Is it more intentional? Because I think even the students and you know the people who are in early career from high income countries probably don't get enough of the opportunity to work at oh, yeah. such a higher level. Mm -hmm. No, we open the door to everybody. Like it's a, it's on our website, the application to be a mentee, so anybody can throw their hat in the ring. Um, we just have the councils where they know they don't have systematic review are aggressively going out to their council members to say you need to apply here so that we can bring this capacity back to wherever. And so um, when they're identified like that, we try to make sure that all our mentees cover all the countries contributing to ILCOR, so that not 15 coming from Canada and one from Taiwan. It's equally distributed in the selection of this giant pool of applicants. Right, thank you so much, Laurie, for that fantastic presentation. Okay. All right, a great start to our session on Guidelines Without Borders. And our next speaker is Marge Reinap. Uh, so Marge started her professional career in the Ministry of Social Affairs of Estonia on health policy. Uh, she joined WHO in 2012 as a head of country office in Estonia and was responsible for the WHO operations in the country and particularly of relevance is the strengthen strengthening and optimising guideline development and evidence informed policy making in the country. Uh, nowadays Marge leads the work on evidence for policy development uh, for WHO regional office for Europe since 2020. And her work area covers providing support to WHO member states in the European region and strengthening, monitoring and evaluating national capacity to identify, translate and use evidence in policy and practice. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Please welcome Marge. Yeah, thank you, thank you. This is my first time speaking in front of few people. I hope it's like uh, picking up cycling in Denmark when I joined uh, 2020, uh, just before COVID. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to be here, and, and thank you uh, for inviting me to, to, to speak to the guideline community and friends of guidelines. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is how WHO guidelines, but not only, also uh, guidelines developed uh, on a global level, regional level, national level, guidelines developed by you, your organizations, could uh, contribute to improving Health, uh, how health decisions are made in countries uh, that don't yet have the ability to develop trustworthy guidelines. So, and uh, more specifically, um, I um, speak about how, what the value I have seen in uh, guideline adaptation uh, in implementation, um, also what challenges there are, as well as what can and, 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 and should be done to increase, um, increase inequity and um, uh, reduce inequity and increase efficiency. I'll come back to the equity part. Uh, my declaration of interest, um, there are none. I'm salaried staff for WHO. We have very strict rules in, uh, in, in financial uh, aspects, so no financial conflicts. I'm also a member of WHO Guideline Review Committee and this is my contribution to guideline production, and that's, that's that. Um, the views are my own. Um, 
I do have maybe one uh, conflict or bias that I need to clear here. Uh, and uh, although I'm covering the whole WHO European region, um, you may see that I am a bit biased um, on Estonia and, and the focus um, and many case studies are coming from Estonia. I think there may be a few regions. I'm an Estonian. Uh, secondly, this is part of my journey that I want to share with you, as well as I think uh, there are lessons learned um, during um, the guideline uh, harmonization uh, process that we have done there. So, um, and um, it's a bit dizzy, uh, but uh, when, even before I joined WHO, I had an invite in my calendar from my predecessor, uh, Jarno Habit, um, an inspirational leader now leading the, the WHO operations in, in Ukraine. Um, and he said that this is a thing, this is a thing that, where you don't drop the ball. He wanted to make sure that this initiative uh, that uh, he, together with uh, our colleagues uh, Suhil and Holger Schunemann, had started in Estonia with Estonian Health Insurance Fund, University of Tartu, were continued. And I, I would be uh, supporting this. And I, had, uh, I did not know anything about guidelines. <laughs> I, I knew that guidelines are developed by societies, how to de de uh, de deliver care and improve uh, how uh, their operations. But um, from my perspective, coming from the public health field, it did not, it did not ring the bell. But uh, during those 10 years where we have been working together with different experts, um, I have been becoming a firm believer and uh, in, uh, I don't, have to, uh, I don't have to tell you what a guideline is, but here I just wanted to show that what is the focus is for me coming from health policy and decision making and uh, seeing, sitting uh, on, around the table with many decision makers, many health uh, professionals, and not being able to agree on things, agree on what would be the health program components, what, where the money would come, and how to arrange care. And throughout the process of modernizing how guidelines were developed in Estonia, we saw uh, how powerful a guideline uh, development method is when it's done properly, when it's trustworthy, when it's transparent, and I'll talk more about this. And, and then I really felt that this ball is mine. This is my passion. And, uh, and this is what uh, I want to pass on. And now coming to the equity part. We started our conference with a focus on equity. But we talked a lot on equity uh, in guidelines, in, in um, policies by Sir Michael Marmot. I want to show you another dimension of equity. Can you show a, sand of ha a hand, sign of hands if you are a guideline developer from, let's say, developed economy countries, low uh, or middle income country that you consider to uh, represent any of, of those countries? I see couple. Probably there is a selection bias, obviously. Toronto is far, and it's North uh, America, so probably these people were not able to travel here. But if we look also, the um, GIN members um, from my region, I saw a couple. So that's the, for me, it's equity in decision making. Yesterday, um, we heard about um, colleagues from Czech Republic presented how guidelines were developed before um, their excellent program was, was initiated. I heard guidelines development in the past, eminence-based guidelines, COBSAT, Good Old Boys 
sat around the table and came up with a recommendation. And then here we talk about the methods, approaches, improvements, and we are a believer that these will lead better decisions. Why then there is a, there's a divide here? For those countries where we are not talking about explicitly about grade, transparency, and they ha don't have capacities yet to develop the guidelines themselves. Then WHO has been filling that gap. And yesterday we, we heard Lisa Askey uh, talking about um, the way um, we develop guidelines and all the efforts that are put into um, the getting the quality, trustworthy guidelines to the countries to provide policymakers, practitioners, and patients with clear guidance. Our main mandate is to threefold promote health, keep the world safe, serve the vulnerable. These are the people. And everything we do in our action in WHO, including developing guidelines, they need to lead to impact. They need to improve health outcomes uh, that we, together with our member states, are um, aiming at. And these are the decisions on, on bedside. These are the decisions on how to treat the patient and, um, what, uh, uh, and, and, and this happens in communities, hospitals, primary care centers. So this is not about global. This is very much local. And yesterday we talked about the global guideline development. Here this is a global picture and you see small dots there representing our country offices. Um, we do have three levels of organizations and the closest we are to the countries is the country office. The country offices are around in 150 countries excluding um, the countries you are mostly coming from. I didn't see hands uh, that many from low and middle income countries. We do have also um, uh, member, um, representation in countries and in high income countries like Czech Republic, Estonia and, and some other EU countries uh, who um, share the same history. Now zooming in into WHO European region where I'm I'm working on, on evidence to policy is that it's, it's also bigger than you have been used to see. And it's spanning from Iceland to Tajikistan, covering also Central Asia, Western Balkans, and, and other countries um, uh, that, that usually don't be, are, are not seen as, as e, um, European countries. So it's a vast range. And I'm leaving out all the, uh, all the countries where we don't have uh, representation and focusing on just bringing three countries uh, and, and showing the diversity. Um, these are out of proportion because otherwise I would not be, have been able to put Estonia's name on in terms of um, uh, area. Um, but, uh, and I, I show you a few graphs of data in terms of the difference. Uh, and these are the latest data the countries have been providing us and, and obviously it does not reflect the disruption happening in Ukraine with the, with the war. Um, and uh, it has also um, disrupted our work on, on guideline development. So if you look at even on population size and composition, but also on, on what are the areas of, of health issues. And you see the diversity and that drives the, the need and demand of different types of um, uh, questions and that the um, decision makers are seeking answers to. But also if you look at the, that what are the possibilities to address these health issues. How many health workers there are? 
but also especially how much resources these countries have. And these, you know, if you can uh, think on that you have, a country has $53 per person for a year to organize whole care, everything. And that means that every decision in these countries that they make needs to be spun on. They cannot, they cannot afford waste. They cannot ha afford both poor decisions. But in those countries, there are no evidence-based decision-making uh, processes. So, so there is the equity. But then the recommendations globally, wherever, they don't necessarily consider all these contextual factors. But when the recommendations that does not fit into the context, what does happen with that? It's, it's going to be disregarded. It's useless. Because it's nothing, you can advise Tajikistan to buy certain medicine, but they cannot afford. Obviously in Tajikistan, the average um, quality or the average um, you know, the salaries of the doctors are lower, but the health technologies are produced there, and they are expensive. So, so that's, the, that's the focus. And I would argue here that if we are not able to adapt the recommendation, there is no implementation, no impact, and what's to use then for the recommendation? So I'm, I'm bringing a, now coming back to the promised Estonia's examples of guideline adaptation where we have still an issue of uh, quite a high burden, but also issue in a sense that now that we are effectively treating HIV, um, it has become a chronic condition and we have more people to care for. And there's, there's still quite a many um, issues, many questions where there was not consensus um, among clinicians and, and will not really decide on whether we provide um, care closer to uh, the person who needs care, can the primary care doctors take over some of the burden, what uh, would be the first line regimen um, and also new preventive measures such as uh, pre exposure prophylactic. So, this needed discussion and this needed making decisions. And this was long. We did some evaluations by, by WHO externally, providing suggestions for improvements. Not much. In 2016, WHO started. Um, the 